you very much, Pavan. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here and uh, to do this presentation on, on, I think, a topic that uh, will raise very high on the, on the global agenda very quickly. And I will try to explain why I believe that, uh, that there's so many potentials when you look at uh, ecological restoration, both from um, the economic point of view we're going to talk a little about, but also from uh, the climate change adaptation point of view. And this work on, on uh, <clears throat> ecosystem and uh, the benefits of restoration of ecosystems goes, uh, has a long history, but I think it's right now when we, we have started to get the tools to actually get things together and, and also start to make really credible uh, calculations because we have uh, uh, a lot of interesting data, a lot of published data and uh, good data which we could ba base our analysis. But I'm going to start with, um, before we go into restoration, that <clears throat> to give the perspective on, on what type of planet we're living on, uh, there is a, this new concept of the anthromes. All of you have heard about the biomes, which is a concept to describe the, the typical large-scale ecosystems that cover the, the surface of the planet. Uh, the concept of the anthrom is trying to bring in humans <clears throat> as one important actor uh, influencing uh, ecological processes at all scales. So on this figure you will see um, anthrums that are categorized uh, in very sort of different, different types depending on how dense settlements are. But as you can see, you have the, the red, the purple, and the yellow which are all very much influenced by humans. <clears throat> and the green would be the wildlands. These are the areas in the world that still have less influence. They will, they will still be influenced, but less influence of humans. So you can see that the majority of, of areas on the planet have a very large uh, human influence, where humans would influence ecological processes at multiple scales. And you can particularly see that Europe, uh, India, and Southeast Asia and East Asia are areas with very high human settlement and very high impact of humans on, <clears throat> on the flora, the fauna, the microorganisms. And this is the type of new planet that is emerging that we need to understand and, and how to deal with. How do we deal with a planet that is becoming increasingly uh, human dominated? I've got to show you another aspect of human domination, which is um, Connectivity. Each yellow dot here is an airplane. Oops. Um, and this shows um, 24 hours uh, of air traffic. <clears throat> it's um, morning in East Asia. It's not, now it's starting to be morning in Europe. You can see when Heathrow wakes, it's, the whole of Europe becomes yellow of all airplanes. And you will see traffic starting going from from London and Paris to uh, New York and other major American airports. Uh, I think this in a way show what's uh, usually very invisible to us, that is the connectivity, uh, both within continents and between continents. And this has major implications, <coughs> both positive and negative, of course, that there are lots of positive that uh, information sharing um, and knowledge sharing, uh, but there are also very many potential dangers of this huge and increased connectivity that uh, also just continues. So if we look at the planet, um, we could maybe construct a typology where we have on the top here uh, rather sort of wide lands areas with less human impact, but then a su succession of increasing human impact all the way down where we have severely degraded habitats. And I think the policy for a more sustainable management of ecosystems in the world will have to be directed. How do we stay away from ending up at the bottom? How do we maintain most of the planet somewhere in between these two? How do we <coughs> encourage uh, a management of natural resources that will maintain uh, essential functions, uh, ecological structures, functions, and, and processes to deliver uh, the ecosystem services on which humans uh, are dependent. And we need to put this in a perspective that we, we need to actually <coughs> be able to feed another 50% more people 
uh, until 2050. And this is a, a tremendous challenge, and, and I will explain why it is a challenge, and that is that for many areas of the world, we're already at the bottom, where we have a rather severe degradation of the soil. And I think this map, where you, where you see the red areas being <clears throat> rather severe, uh, degraded areas, uh, these are the areas where we actually need to be very innovative and think how can we restore this area to be, again, productive and contribute to uh, production of ecosystem services, uh, and particularly food and clean water for a growing uh, human population on the planet. So this is the great challenge for restoration ecology to find out how do we do this in different biomes, under different uh, <clears throat> biological uh, conditions, in different social economic conditions, and other ways which we could actually develop a template for uh, restoring ecosystems and particularly also other very strong economic incentives for nations, for corporations, for individuals to engage uh, in, in ecological restoration. Well, the nations have already decided that this is a top priority area. So this is uh, the de decision from uh, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity that met in Nagoya in October last year and um, one of the targets, target 15, explicitly say that the nations, the 193 nations <coughs> that are signatories to uh, the convention agreed that before 2020, at least 15% of all degraded habitats should be restored. And if we go back, that would be 15% of these red areas, which is a substantial area, which where there would be needed a lot of input of knowledge, uh, <clears throat> investments, e economic incentives, and, and institutions to make this possible. Now, what is restoration? Well, <clears throat> I think the most modern definition of restoration is, is a process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. So this is a very pragmatic definition that you're not including any specific target that you're restoring to a certain condition uh, that happened to be at that area 100 years ago or 200 years ago. Uh, this pragmatic definition just tells you that you will assist in the recovery process from a very low productive state. I think this figure is uh, interesting showing uh, the different uh, possibilities that could happen when you start restoring a system. What do you see on, on A uh, is, is the curve going up to what is called the reference state. And this would be a very unlikely event, outcome of a restoration that you will be so successful that you will actually to 100% reach your target. Uh, that will be uh, a very rare uh, event. Most uh, likely you will find, uh, if you follow a restoration project, something um, following the line B. Maybe this B could be higher or lower on, on, on that scale, but you, you will reach some asymptote and, and it will be difficult for you to, to increase uh, the diversity of ecosystem services or diversity of species, for example, over time. That you have to calculate that you will never perhaps reach 100% of your target of, or your reference date. But there are other outcomes that we need to keep in mind. <laughs> One is uh, uh, D, which actually, uh, my interpretation, it's based on empirical data. My interpretation is here that uh, this system lost resilience, that you, you were very successful in the beginning, but then there was some perturbation that kicked the system back, and you didn't have sufficient uh, components of resilience in that system to maintain it on, on the, the trajectory. Uh, e, I think, is very troublesome uh, because what we probably have here is uh, a system that has flipped. So from one stability domain to another, and it's really difficult, perhaps impossible, to restore this system. That we have encountered what is called a hysteresis effect. That <clears throat> in, in order to flip this system back, you need to invest enormously in reducing those variables that in the first place uh, resulted in, in a regime shift, that it's practically or economically uh, impossible uh, to do. And we should be aware of that. 
<coughs> e is actually one outcome uh, that we should count on, that we actually will not be able to restore a system, that it actually has flipped more or less permanently. But in some cases, we could show enormously successful uh, <coughs> effects of restoration. This is from South Africa, where to the left you see the economic benefit of, of very heavy grazing in a landscape. What they did in South Africa was that they reduced the grazing, the stocking <coughs> of cattle in the landscape, and allowed vegetation to come back. And you can see then you have this uh, diversity of services that emerged from the system that you have tourism, you have <coughs> uh, uh, carbon sequestration, carbon storage, you have improved water quality and water supply. And when you add the economic benefits of those, you can see that it was in fact a very good investment in this landscape to reduce uh, cattle grazing, not to zero. Did they just reduce it uh, sufficient enough to get the vegetation back uh, and to get the succession going and you got all these other functions and processes. <coughs> So in some cases, it's, it's very crystal clear that you can show enormous benefits from, from a restoration management. But we also always have to deal with trade-offs. And I know uh, Tom Barker, when he was here, uh, showed the same figure. It's out of the chapter two of, of the D0. It's one way of capturing uh, th these trade-offs, which we have to deal with and understand that on, <coughs> on the x-axis you have a provisioning ecosystem service. This could be uh, crops, this could be uh, fiber or fuel or some other commodity. And on the y-axis we will have regulating services. Now there are many bit different possibilities here <clears throat> that if you increase the, uh, the production of a, of a provisioning service, how that would affect the regulating. It could <coughs> affect them very steeply, like in, in the first line, A, you could have more a linear relationship, or you could have, as in C, that the system actually would be very tolerant, that you could increase the <coughs> production of provisioning services quite high before you have a steep decline. Which type of relationship you have in your system is crucial for how you develop your management. But in, in theory, you can see that for, e, for a given level of production of, pro, of, of provisioning service, you could have three potential levels of regulating services. And the, we need to understand the possibilities of moving between them. So if you're down on, on that level, wh what are the conditions to moving uh, to the two others? To actually still continue producing uh, provisioning services, but maintaining a much higher level of regulating service uh, in your system. So that, that you can say is one challenge to restoration, that you don't, you don't want to uh, restore by reducing all the economic provisioning so the commodities, but you want to find this way how you could maintain that production and also have um, a production of regulating services. I've got to walk this through because I think this could also illustrate <coughs> the way of thinking here. If we take um, number one here, the intensive agricultural landscape. This is a landscape characterized by, by producing perhaps one of very few provisioning services and nothing else, very few regulating services. Uh, this would be obviously not very sustainable in, in the long run. This very intensive agricultural landscape would be dependent on, on high input of energy and pesticides and fertilizers and given uh, fossil fuel price increases, given climate change and, and, and water shortages, it's very likely that most of this very intensive agricultural landscape will move out of that position. Uh, the production per hectare of intensive crops will move to the left. But there are two different alternatives. You can either move along that axis <coughs> and it will represent just a reduction, or you can manage the system in, when it transforms so that it also will generate more regulating services. It will be a better landscape for handling water regulation, for example, a better landscape uh, for soil formation. We could take landscape number two, which is more of a conservation landscape where you <coughs> society invested in the protection. Uh, and particularly in, in tropical areas, you will, we will expect uh, increasing pressure on these areas uh, 
that they, <coughs> they also have to generate uh, provisioning services. Now there are different ways that could happen. One is just degradation and th that you will use that protected area or that conservation landscape for some um, commodity. <clears throat> or there are other possibilities that you actually could try to combine the two, that you actually increase the production of provisioning services while maintaining most of your regulating services and biodiversity. The number three, you have a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah please. Well, given that, sort of how do you, <clears throat> um, then, you know, are, are there cases where there has been conflicts of interest? Well, yeah, th this conflict of interest, yes, those are very uh, apparent. What I think, uh, um, what, what the data show us is that th this is probably scale dependent, that this type of relationship you could find on the plot or maybe on the farm level. Uh, this type of relationship is more on the, on the larger landscape level. So here again, the actors need to go together. So this might be what the the local farmer will experience. But if all the farmers in the landscape um, uh, sort of manage their, their land in the same way, we might end up over that tipping point. So here, sort of the regional and national actors also need to be in a negotiation. How do you manage this larger landscape to avoid that tipping point? <coughs> and uh, and this would relate to this as well. If you go to the degraded landscape, this would be a la landscape that would produce very few provisioning or non-provisioning services and very few regulating. So this is an area wh where you have to do something for it to, to uh, generate anything of value. But again, there are different ways that could happen. One is that you just in increase the provisioning service. For example, you plant biofuel, that's it. Or you could also <clears throat> restore it by increasing uh, the diversity of regulating services. And I think um, the difference which trajectory you will follow would very, very much depend on the type of institutions. Both um, uh, the national legislation, uh, economic incentives, but also informal institutions that will be important locally. <coughs> so in this way, I think restoration ecology is developing into to a science where we actually would talk about social ecological restoration. We need to look at these two dimensions simultaneously uh, if it's, it's going to be effective. We need to look at what are the ecological conditions, but we also need to look at what are the social, economic, and institutional conditions. And what are, what are sort of our targets here? So I'm going to walk you through um, one study that is right now in review uh, on looking at the benefits of, of uh, restoration. And, and the basic question we asked in this paper was, does it make economic sense to invest in the restoration of ecosystems? We could find a lot of other arguments why we should do it. <clears throat> if we restore to increase um, regulating services, if we uh, restore to increase um, particularly aesthetic and cultural services. But if we look at the economics, would it make sense? And 
here I just listed some of the assumptions that underlie this paper. And, and assumptions are critical, and you could choose to <clears throat> sort of use different types of assumptions, and, and this is important that there is a high transparency on how, how did you uh, do your calculations and what were your assumptions. In this case, um, uh, we used a 20-year horizon, which is sort of the bounded time frame we were looking at. Uh, we were looking at uh, discount rates from minus 2 to uh, up to 8%. And uh, the high discount rate in this case uh, uh, is adding more weight to the cost uh, than to the benefits. We also introduced an operating cost uh, in the maintenance of, of a restoration. And then we looked at um, the benefits, that they were not immediately apparent from year one, that there was this phasing in of benefits because of there is a succession going on in the system with uh, increasing complexity and functions and processes. So um, very likely you would have uh, a time lag before you could actually cash in the benefits <coughs> of your restoration effort. This, this, of course, would vary very much from one system to another. Here we use some sort of an average for a large number of different systems, but Ideally, you would like to fine-tune them to each specific uh, system. But this, <coughs> this study now uh, started to scrutinize some 2,000 papers on, on restoration and came down to about 200 that actually had information on the benefits and the cost of restoration. And so here is a compilation of the benefits. And uh, what you can see in this table uh, a lot of figures, but what what's, I think actually sticks out the most is that uh, benefits from coral reefs and uh, coastal systems are very high. Uh, <clears throat> so in the order of six million dollars per hectare, uh, or two and a half to six million dollars per hectare for coral reefs. Um, But then we're also looking at the cost of restoration. And this, I think, is um, the first time there's really been made a uh, very comprehensive uh, assessment of the cost of restoration. So there are about 200 studies <coughs> been included in this analysis. And what this shows is that we have a variation in cost of restoration. Uh, and even though benefits of coral reefs are high, so are the costs of restoration. While for some, some other areas like grasslands, the cost of restoration is quite low. So the next step then is actually to look at the benefit cost ratio. This is the interesting graph to look at <clears throat> what is actually uh, the benefit given the investment you have uh, to do. And as you see, co for coral reefs, um, that co <clears throat> benefit cost ratio is quite low. It's still positive. It's still uh, the, still generate uh, benefits, but both high cost and high, high benefits. And, but then we move through these biomes. So when we come to tropical forest, temperate forest, we, we, we're getting into quite high benefit cost ratios. And, and for grasslands, it could be particularly high. It's interesting, for, for example, to look at tropical forest, that um, uh, the benefit cost ratio there, that <coughs> it could be very high, and when you look back, you can see that um, the cost could actually be very low in some tropical areas. And again, this is scale dependent. If you have restoration of, of a tropical forest where you have lots of, of genetic sources, seeds and dispersing animals, uh, this is a succession that will cost very little, and you, and you will get um, quite rapidly uh, a growing forest with very high complexity. You had a question? So I was, I was wondering, well, because you said this, this is an average of 260 studies. So, but then on a five coral reef in this way, maybe this just needs to make a fair amount. Yeah, but you, as you see, the ranges are quite big. So. Uh, but I'm saying the ratios must change depending on the region. Uh, yes, you mean the, the cost would be different from one region to another and the benefits as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but this is sort of transferred into, um, uh, the 2007 sort of 
cost in, in US dollars? Would there's some sort of transfer mechanism here to, to get the comparability? So the conclusions uh, from this paper, going through several thousands of paper, ending up with a couple of hundred that had really good data, uh, is that we, we're starting to get more and more confident about what are the benefits cost ratios of restoration and, uh, and that it could range and be quite low, so for example for coral reefs around one, but up to as high as 27 for grasslands. So particularly grasslands would gener generate high benefits. And then, <clears throat> of course, we, we need to take into account that um, in these studies, not all services uh, were um, calculated an economic benefit, and also there are, of course, services wh where there, there, it's difficult to calculate, or w perhaps we shouldn't calculate the economic benefit. All the services that are related to cultural, uh, the cultural dimension, uh, and so, services that are, that are related to religion, uh, aesthetics, uh, and so forth. And these also need to be, in one way or another, taken into account. Uh, that when you're restoring a system, uh, you're also in the process um, assisting in restoring some of those services which are not possible to uh, put an economic value on. Now I'm going to switch, <coughs> talking about more specifically on, on restoration in urban landscapes. And, and the reason I'm doing that is because, <coughs> well, there are two reasons. One is that w when you go to a very highly uh, populated urban area, you have a huge number of beneficiaries of just a very tiny investment. Just restoring one hectare could serve thousands or tens of thousands of people. Uh, so there is this potential of having a, a very large outreach of, of even a small investment. The other one is, <coughs> well actually there are three reasons uh, I bring this up. The other <coughs> one is that we are getting more and more studies showing that uh, green spaces in, in cities uh, are very important for, for human health. And um, that having green spaces will reduce health expenditure uh, quite substantially. So, it's interesting uh, for municipalities to start calculating that avoided cost uh, by having green spaces uh, in cities that are used for recreation. And the third, which I will come to, is that cities are, are facing uh, particular challenges when it comes to climate change and where actually ecosystems could be, uh, I would argue, a low cost, low maintenance, <clears throat> and low carbon option for dealing with those challenges. But the world goes to town. Uh, in 2030, we're going to be 5 billion people living in cities, nearly a doubling from today. And someone said that human history will ever more become urban history. We're becoming an urban species. And we need to learn more about this uh, urban habitat. This is just a reflection of how rapid this process is. In 1950, there were eight cities uh, in the world that were megacities, more than 5 million people. In 2015, just four years from now, there are going to be 80, and most of them in, in East Asia. This is an enormous, incredibly uh, rapid development. And we also have a huge knowledge gap. <clears throat> the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment made a huge and, and I think tremendous effort in, in bringing a fourth understanding of, of ecosystems and ecosystem services all around the world except the urban. There is this tiny chapter in, in all of the MA 20 volumes uh, that deals with, with the urban system. And then when you go to the World Development Report <coughs> published by the World Bank, which is probably the largest assessment of urbanization, it deals with demography, sanitation, health issues, uh, but rarely mentions ecosystems. So here's a gap we need to bridge and try to understand what, what understanding do we have of ecosystems and what are their roles in, in the urban context? And there are ecosystem services in urban areas, <clears throat> and, but they are poorly understood and poorly uh, investigated, and we don't have really good um, valuation of these ecosystem services. Here's one way of building a topology of these ecosystem services. And so to the left, you would have mostly these regulating services, 
that could be important for <coughs> climate change adaptation to regulate water. We have the, the more biological related services. And to the right, I think what is even more emphasized in, in the urban area is the cultural dimension of ecosystems and the connection to health issues, which really needs to be brought on the table and understood. So what do we do with urban degraded land? There are lots of urban degraded land. <clears throat> and could we actually restore these to functioning systems? And what would be the value of the services they would generate? This picture <clears throat> is taken not very far from here. This is Fresh Kills landfill in, on Staten Island in New York. Uh, this was a landfill that was closed in, in the 90s. And um, the city decided that <clears throat> after the closing that they would actually invest money, substantial money, in restoring this to become uh, an amenity area, an area for recreation. That was a very bold decision given the way it looked. And given that you had probably the most uh, severe conditions for restoration, you had toxic soils, you had lots of plastic and <clears throat> non-biological material, uh, you had very species poor uh, vegetation to start with. Um, you had all sorts of problems to deal with. So this was a challenge for, for the ecologists that started. And I want to give uh, <coughs> a tribute to uh, Professor Stephen Handel at Rutgers University that led uh, the biological part of this. He made a tremendous effort in, in actually showing how you could do this, how you could go from this. and. You look down there to the left, this is what it looks today, and, and here is sort of the more visionary for the future. Hopefully not all of that will be, uh, be uh, <clears throat> realized. But what they did uh, was that they brought in soil. This was absolutely necessary because you had so much toxins uh, on that landfill. So they put out uh, <coughs> a she rubber sheet to, to protect uh, the groundwater and then then um, they put um, uh, more than a meter of, of new soil on top of that. Uh, and that was sort of the new soil they used for um, uh, planting uh, vegetation. And this is the tricky thing with restoration in urban areas, that usually you, you were dealing with very poor soils and, and often toxic soils. So the most <coughs> uh, costly part of a restoration would actually be this initial trying to deal with with increasing the soil quality. But then they did, I think, something really interesting and, and clever, and, and it worked uh, beautifully. And that, is, that was that they actually did plant little islands of trees that produce fleshy fruits <coughs> in that big area. And what happened was that they started to attract birds from nearby remnant forests. And what, what they actually managed to create was sort of a natural successional process that birds would fly in, they would carry seeds, and they would drop the seeds, and you, you would start uh, succession. And even in the first year, <coughs> they got about 25 different species of, of, <coughs> of trees and shrubs that produce fleshy fruits that actually ended up in their seed traps they, where they were monitoring. And here's just a list of, <coughs> of what they got. And then the second year, they got even more, but different species. So over time, they had a huge diversity of, of uh, species moving into this area. And this graph shows that these islands they created out in this huge restoration area was crucial for that attracting th these birds. And the birds would drop the seeds, and you would get these seedlings growing up in these islands. And those islands would then be sort of hotspots. And from there, the succession would take on. So even though costs were really high for managing the soil in the beginning, this was very cheap because we used, they used all the birds <laughs> to, to, to uh, bring in uh, a native flora uh, into this area. And this is what it looks like today. And what you can see <coughs> around this area now is that uh, the property rights start to increase. And that is actually part of financing the restoration, that the revenues from increasing, or the property values are increasing, so the tax will be used for, for um, uh, paying some of the restoration. And 
I think there were some important lessons from this project that you could get significant and rather rapid effects on many ecosystem services uh, in this area, even though the conditions were really bad when you started. And <coughs> that in an urban area, you have these other possibilities of, of finding sources of finance, like uh, when property right values go up, that the taxes would be part of um, contributing to financing. But, uh, yeah. I think it started in 98. Then, um, when 9-11 happened, they opened up Fresh Kills again to take all the debris from, from Manhattan, from the, the towers. And uh, then, after that, <coughs> there was a long discussion on um, the future of this, because then there was many that raised the voice that we want to make this a m memorial park. And uh, so now they've sort of changed the design now. It, it's got to be um, very nicely a memorial park. But there were lots of strong feelings at the time because a lot of people said that they objected that their relatives will be end up on a landfill. And, uh, but I think now the, there is a consensus that this will be a very nice uh, memorial place uh, in the commemoration of all a lot of the people that died in 9-11. In but <clears throat> what hasn't been done really for the Fresh Kills area uh, is to look at sort of the aggregated benefits of that restoration. And we went through, uh, this is another paper that was sent in simultaneously with the other one just, just right a few days ago, um, looking at uh, the benefits of ecosystem services, restoration of ecosystem services in cities. And here, we didn't, we couldn't start with 2,000 papers. We found 10. That's it. I mean, it's, I, I, I was, uh, <laughs> there must be more research. There were only 10 papers which had actually dealt with benefits and looking at, and also cost, and made those calculations on, on an area basis. And we're, <clears throat> so here is an area for doing a lot of exciting research in the future. What we found was that the st studies have made uh, quantification of ecosystem services, so they've been looking at um, pollution control, carbon storage, uh, stormwater reduction, energy savings, and you see they're mostly in North American and Chinese cities so far. We found a few in, in uh, South Africa and one in Canada, but still there are lots, large parts of the world where, where we need to understand these things much better. So based on these calculations <coughs> and quantifications of, of these services, um, these papers or these authors have, had also transferred them into an economic value. So here we have estimates of economic value, and this would be the generation of uh, benefits uh, per hectare per year, uh, and uh, for 13 different services. And again, air quality, carbon sequestration, storage, uh, recreation, uh, positive health effects. Um, there was only one study uh, that actually did an per area basis calculation of health effects, uh, but it's very high. Uh, but since there's only one study, we did not include it in, in our average. We ended up with an, <clears throat> with an average of, of 12,000 US dollar per hectare per year and, and with a range between five to 20,000 US dollar per hectare per year. Yeah. Yes, yes. Mm. There are lots of, yeah, I mean, uh, there are lots of studies that have done uh, estimates of health effects, but not on a per hectare basis. Yeah. Yeah. And then we looked after literature on, on the cost of restoration, and again, we didn't have 2,000 studies to start with. Uh, there were just a handful that actually provided the cost <coughs> of restoration. So, so these are the average, uh, they're quite high numbers, 
but this is what you would expect in urban areas, um, particularly when, when you have to deal with uh, uh, <coughs> uh, poor soil conditions. Uh, but again, then we looked at the benefit cost ratios and we put the urban like in, in the other figure. And, and interestingly, it, ha it sort of ends up here in, in the right part of the figure. Uh, you have a range from about 2 to 15, uh, but it's comparable to uh, the benefit cost ratios for forest or, or woodlands uh, in more rural areas. And again, this will not take into account the cultural values of these. And we have not taken into account the health value. So if we do the health value, this might just spike right up. So the benefit, <coughs> the conclusions here that um, we have a range from two to five, given all the constraints of, of this study, which is comparable to restoration elsewhere. I mean, restoration in an urban area, given the complexities and, and <coughs> the high cost is still, um, has uh, a range that uh, is substantial and this should actually be on the table in, in the urban planning, that when you're deciding what to do, uh, if you have uh, an industrial area, a brownfield area, uh, which you're planning to develop, that there could be different options that you have. Of course, you build new housing and you build malls and you build uh, infrastructure, but this could also be part of that planning and, and actually taking into account the benefits of uh, that restoration. And given that, it could actually be much, much higher than we have, have indicated here. And also one thing we didn't take into account is um, sort of the value these ecosystems could have in the urban landscape when it comes to climate change. This is what all cities have to face, <coughs> um, and how to adapt to climate change and also the transformation to a future beyond fossil fuel. These are major, major challenges. And <clears throat> I argue that there's lots of opportunities for innovative use and restoration of ecosystems to address this. This could be, for example, addressing uh, the heat island effect, heat waves, uh, flooding, storm, uh, <clears throat> food production. I will not talk too much about that today, but that's a whole other area of urban agriculture. <clears throat> and lastly, uh, someone's carbon sequestration. But urban heat waves um, is becoming a great concern. Uh, and in Europe, we had in 2003 a very severe heat wave that caused an excess mortality of about 70,000 uh, in the cities. <clears throat> and the two segments of the population are particularly vulnerable. One is the older segment that perhaps is less mobile and, and get dehydrated and the youngest, which is also less mobile and get dehydrated. And, and so among these two uh, groups, we had a very high excess mortality. <clears throat> and this is something that society needs to take into account when planning for, for the future, that we will have heat waves and it will affect the population. And, and what can we do about it? So for example, for Greater Manchester, they calculated um, these uh, areas which will, <laughs> show really high peaks in temperature during heat waves given different scenarios of climate change. And <clears throat> what could you then do about it? Well, one is to plant trees. It's very simple. Uh, there is a <clears throat> very strong cooling effect of trees. And if you increase the canopy cover 10%, from 10 to 20 in a city, you might reduce the ambient temperature of three, three degrees, which is uh, a substantial decrease when it comes to reducing those peaks. And a lot of cities um, in Europe and North America now have, have put this 20% as one of the targets. And in New York, there's a 1 million tree project. In Los Angeles, a 2 million tree project. <laughs> and, but they all have, um, there are several reasons why they've started this, but one is, is to actually accomplish this cooling effect, and, and that's why they also tend to plant them in areas which have already very little green. So they would increase um, uh, the amount of green. And in Manchester, they did this calculation. Um, 
where they actually compared, given these different scenarios for uh, climate change and temperature increase, where <coughs> they had uh, a scenario also with losing 10% of the green spaces or adding 10%, like restoring, uh, com compared to status quo. And, and what you can see to the right here in 2080 uh, on the high scenario, that the difference between uh, restoring 10%, increasing 10% of green area, and losing is about uh, 8 degrees, which is a substantial change or substantial difference in, in climate in the city. <coughs> Here's another uh, example of where large-scale restoration is uh, becoming high on the agenda. Uh, this is a familiar picture. Uh, this huge trauma in September 2005 in New Orleans. But what is happening in Southern Louisiana, and maybe there are people here from, from New Orleans or, or Southern Louisiana, but this realization that <clears throat> uh, the huge wetlands in Southern Louisiana that disappeared the last 50, 60 years and actually made New Orleans much, much more vulnerable to the storm. So what is happening now is, is uh, investment in restoration of wetlands. It's a slow process and it's, it's very expensive. But again, the benefits of that are huge. If you could, because this is New Orleans <coughs> with two or 300,000 people preparing for a uh, future with climate change. Uh, not only with increased uh, frequency of hurricanes, but also rising sea level. And we know that every kilometer of wetland <coughs> would reduce the wave height by one meter. So you could actually transfer that into how you build safety for the city. So I think this gives a lot of impetus to dig deeper into how restoration actually could be used as part of the strategy to meet climate change challenges. And uh, in, I think particularly in cities, one of the most important, uh, <coughs> and to reduce um, um, the risk of natural hazards, um, but also secure water, um, uh, energy, and food security, as uh, written here on, on uh, this table that outlined one of the projects you're doing. So I think it would be really fantastic if some of you would engage in, in investigating this further and much more in detail. Uh, this is quite a new area, and, uh, and also I think it's hard because there's not much written about it, but also exciting because if you do write something, you would be one of the first to put this on, 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 um, <coughs> on a paper or, or starting a discussion about this. So I think it's very worthwhile doing, and particularly since, um, as you've seen, the, the huge amount of money in in these funds for climate change adaptation. But usually, um, from these foundations, they're not thinking of that they, that they should be challenged into restoration. But if we could provide and show the links that if you do this <coughs> uh, investment in restoration, it would generate this benefit and this capacity to, to uh, address climate change challenges. So I will end there. Uh, with this question, to what extent these funds could actually be used for restoration to reduce risk and vulnerability and build resilience to climate change? I think it's a very important question and it needs to be addressed and answered. So thank you very much. Thank you.